Hello and welcome back to AB in Focus. I'm delighted to be joined today by Fernando Murillo, the Head of Retail Banking for Mashrek Bank, and Omar Onsi, the Founder and CEO of Nimcard. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining me and welcome to the show. Thank you, Matthew. Thanks for having us. So to start with, we're here to talk today around banking and around fintech. Firstly, maybe, Fernando, we could start with you here. Fintech, wh why is this important to banks? Why should banks continue to be investing in fintech? Historically, we've always been investing and collaborating with fintech. If you think about uh, credit cards, we're fintech at one point in time. All the, the developments that we need to run our business, our tech, has been coming from fintech that eventually became big tech, okay? And now incumbents and consolidated uh, 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 industries. This is the same, but what we've seen the last decade and perhaps decade and a half has been a, a rejuvenated investment on fintech with the intention to really change the functionalities that can be offered to clients. And that's a very new thing. So fintechs have come in a refreshed way to provide in a very agile way things that were wanted by, by society and banks perhaps were being a bit slow at delivering. And the, the collaboration is absolutely natural. We need to work with them. They will profit from our huge clan base and our knowledge of, of our clients. And we profit from that refresh approach, that agile approach. And this symbiotic uh, way of working is actually quite productive. And Omar, same question to you. Obviously, you come from this from the other side of the spectrum, from yeah. a fintech perspective. Uh, would, how do you see that relationship? Why is it important? Where are you stand on it at the moment? So, you know, fintechs, if you look at entrepreneurship, right, it's all about figuring out where do you see a gap in the market? Where do you see some friction happening in the user experience? And then the, you will find an entrepreneur jumping on, trying to figure that, that out and fixing it, right? And the minute you say the word fintech, it means handling people's money. It means you need to work with a regulated institution, if it's a bank, if it's the regulator. So this is where the collaboration comes in, right, between the fintechs. It's inevitable. It has to happen. And, and as, you know, Fernando was saying, uh, uh, fintechs would move more agile, much faster, smaller organization, much leaner, right? And they're very focused on a, on a, on a single problem, whereby a bank heavily regulated, they've got a lot of responsibility on handling people's money, large institutions, they would move much slower, their compliance processes are much harder. Uh, fintechs, you know, they just move faster and figure out the problem and try to solve it. So this is where we see, you know, the collaboration really important and, and, and it becomes super important. And I mean, I think that's interesting because we're sat here in Dubai in the UAE, which is in itself something of a hub for fintech and financial technology firms. And as you say, when you're talking about banking institutions, it comes with a lot of regulation around handling people's money, but perhaps fintechs have the opportunity to be more agile in that regard. Yeah. How would you see the UAE as a hub for developing these new kinds of technologies? Yeah. So the hub was created simply, again, we go back to the entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurs follow money, right? And, and the UAE created that hub for entrepreneurs to come in. They remove the friction for an entrepreneur to set up, and they remove the friction to raise money and capital, because building any business requires a lot of capital. So this attracted a lot of entrepreneurs, attracted a lot of ideas, and a lot of people trying to solve out, you know, small friction points or big problems that they see in the market, right? So this is this is the main attraction point, and it all starts by, you want to create a hub, how do you attract entrepreneurship, how do you create startups, how do you give them funding, and that, you know, you've created your hub. Absolutely, and we're privileged. I must say, Matthew, it is amazing to see how a country of our size holds 50% of the fintechs in the region. Uh, we're, we're members of the, of the fintech hub, and there's a bouquet of fintechs of all kinds. You cannot imagine. It's like going to the best supermarket of fintechs in the world. Yeah. There are over 500, and, and it's amazing. You can be speed dating with them, and you would not have time to really see how much entrepreneurship and innovation is, is being hosted by, by this country, which is a magnet for talent. 
Would you say then, just to take that acronym slightly, that sorry, that that analogy slightly further, that it's it's a buffet of fintechs where you almost a la carte go in the direction that you need to as as a banking or financial institution? I would choose bouquet more than a buffet. <laughs> <laughs> but but frankly, it, we are really privileged because, as we said, banks we are evolving, right? We're going from being regulated all institutions into, at least in the case of Mashrec, super agile incumbents. Uh, if, you, if you came to Mashrec, you would see a fintech-like approach with hundreds of people working on agile. And we are constantly learning and interacting with those fintechs. And the scent of this bouquet is impregnating, right, the way we, we work, following with the uh, analogy. But frankly, that, that is really a privilege because that gives not just us, not just one bank, the whole sector. It gives us a, a competitive edge between you know, the competition that is healthy for our clients. We can, we can really provide quality of life, which is in the end our, our real job, right? Quality of life for people who have been here for decades, for new people who are coming in the last few years or will come in the future. So it, it's really the, the most difficult thing to find in this business is talent. And having these fintech hubs is, is a fantastic way for us to, to get you know, these talent accessible coming from everywhere in the world. I think you've touched on it a little bit there already, but perhaps we could spend a little bit more time talking about the changing face of banking. The emerging trends, for instance, around banking as a service. How do you see that? How does Mashrek see that? What is the future in that regard? Mashrek is a super progressive bank, and it has been historically so for, for actually since the beginning. Now we are 55 years old, and, and we have showed that in, in our whole history, being the first at you know, launching credit cards, debit cards, ATMs. So innovation is not something that you can develop overnight. It takes time, right? The new thing in the future, which is currently present, is being in the digital world. As in the past, it was uh, having a big branch network and being in every corner and being physically present was essential. In the future, in the present, and now we're talking about metaverse, which is a way of the future to take shape, we will all have to be in the digital spaces. So the way to be there, the way to be digitally present, your products, your services, your brand, is through software. And that software is the APIs, is the standard way of being consumed elsewhere. <laughs> so we, we are designed and structured in an open API approach deliberately so that we can connect and provide banking as a service everywhere. That means that every single digital ecosystem that is emerging right now is emerging in this country. You have to be there because traffic now is not being in a corner. Traffic now is being there. So banking as a service is just our natural way to evolve and being present there in multiple ways. You can, you can make yourself available in multiple ways. But it has, you have to follow a way of working that starts from your, how to channel your innovation and your teams to really make yourself present uh, as banking as a service elsewhere. Omar, perhaps we could get your opinion on the same subject because I imagine you have a slightly different take on the same, same idea. Yeah. So again, I go back to the entrepreneurs, right? When you're having, I'll give you a small example. In 2015, $100 million were invested in tech startups across the region. In 2021, 22, 2.2 billion. So you can imagine the amount of growth in five, six years, right? Over 20X. And all of those companies, they need access to financial services. And the friction is extremely high, right? How do you remove that friction? So a progressive bank like Mashrik there was nothing called offering cards as a service ever in the UAE for 20 years. Why haven't we seen the fintechs launching a lot of innovative payment cards, for example? And Mashrik was the first bank who gave us that opportunity. We hooked up, we integrated. The integration process takes time the first time, but then you have a winning combination to open up that legacy infrastructure or full of friction infrastructure, and suddenly you democratize it, right? So. It's super exciting time right now when you have a progressive bank working with high-tech startups, democratizing what used to be very locked kind of services, and then add to the mix a progressive regulator 
who've stepped up and started, you know, looking at how do we remove friction for those fintechs and startups, right? And, and, and the whole idea, if you don't have something called banking as a service and every fintech has to recreate the same infrastructure that everyone has to do, you're not going to go anywhere. And in a fintech space and tech innovation, it's all about speed as well. So banking as a service is all about removing friction, getting those fintechs to launch in as least time as possible. Launching a payment card used to take a year, year and a half. Now you can do it and we're working on a new program so that you can launch it in a month, in four weeks. So major, major innovation is going to happen with just having something called banking as a service. Also, drilling down on something that you just mentioned there with regards to your experience with the UAE, obviously as a startup chasing innovation, chasing other banks for clients, what has your experience been like setting up a business in the UAE? I'm talking specifically, for instance, in regards to the regulatory atmosphere. How has that played into your approach to trying to provide these new services and new innovative ways of um, identifying these friction points and solving them? From a regulator point of view, so this is all new, right? This is not has been, this hasn't been going for like ten years or so, right? Um, over the past three years, let's say, you would see regulators in the UAE and across the region all working on something called the sandbox. And they started opening up light kind of regulation in a controlled manner, inviting you know, tech startups and fintechs to work, and the regulator was learning. So that, I guess, was stage one. Now stage two, you can see new regulation coming to the market. So in the UAE, two new uh, 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 licenses were issued over the past 18 months, I guess, right? Uh, that would open the door for more fintech innovation to happen. So this is a new movement, and you would see this across in Saudi, you would see it across Egypt. Central banks are stepping up, and, and, and more funding is going into fintech and tech startups. So it's a vicious circle. So one is feeding the other one, right? Uh, maybe we could get Mashrek's approach on the other side on this? No, no, I, I, I think it's the same. Uh, we think alike. These, these regulator or regulators are extremely progressive. Uh, and you can see a proliferation of, again, talent being poured down to try to imagine and regulate how the future of fintech and, and financial institutions uh, altogether will look like. I mean, before getting into a fintech regulation, this is a financial hub. And as such, it needs to provide future for the financial players in the future. Right? So it is, it is just a natural consequence of the nature of the country itself. So we have plenty of talent being poured down, Abu Dhabi Global Markets, the IFC, regulators like Central Bank has a fintech office, uh, VARA now with uh, virtual assets, uh, Dubai Digital Authority. There is a lot of people, lots of think tanks, regulators, supervisors, who are trying to shape the future of the, of the financial industry in the future. And that means, by definition, creating the, the environment where uh, fintechs can thrive and, and how we can collaborate with them in shaping that future and bring things to market faster. Perhaps you could speak a little bit specifically with regards to what, collaborate, what areas you're looking to help solve, what problems you're looking to fix with those collaborations and with investments into fintech. Look, a myriad of those, a myriad of those. But just to mention a few, I think there are at least three spaces that uh, will be hot and will be absolutely, absolutely, absolutely required even today. One is rec tech. There, there is a strong need for uh, technology being applied for compliance related issues. We are all uh, are aware of the fact that how important it is to onboard clients safely, to make sure that the right due diligence is done. The processes today are still too manual, and there's a lot of information, there's a lot of data out there, and there's a lot of artificial intelligence that can be applied to those processes. Name screening is, a, is a, an example of that. So regulatory, rec tech is clearly one. Another is wealth tech. Uh, we are, I think we are in the, in the baby steps of uh, wealth tech. There are good examples in the US, uh, a few in Asia, I think they have to come here. This has to become a, a wealth creation, a wealth management hub for the whole world as well. And, and the third one is credit risk management. 
right? Risk management management is something that we still do with limited amount of information, typically information that we get ourselves as companies, banks, or fintechs, plus what we get from the credit bureau. There is a lot more information out there that we need to ingest to build more robust uh, scoring models in order to lend better and lend more to clients. So those three aspects are clearly, among many others, are clearly uh, super important issues that we banks need, uh, need, uh, need to be helped and we are willing to collaborate. We are willing to find uh, among the bouquet of, uh, of, uh, of uh, these uh, fintechs, we are willing not just to partner up, we are willing to uh, invest. We have set, an, we have set up a, a fintech investment fund, like is the case with Nimcard. We, we don't just want to work together, we want to marry with some of those. And speaking of Nimcard as well, I understand recently Nimcard received card issuer status in the UAE, the first for a fintech in the country. Oh. Talk to me a little bit about that process. What does it mean? What does it mean for customers and for your clients? Yeah. So basically, every fintech that wanted to issue a payment card, right? And almost every fintech needs to issue a payment card because you need to give your clients access to their money. And the best way is right now is give them a card. To do that, you need to work with the technical infrastructure called issuing processing. But then you also need something called bin sponsorship, which handles your settlement. To do that, you need to be regulated by a financial regulator. Uh, banks weren't too fond of doing this because it's a lot of work, regulatory burden, risk, and, and it requires a lot of resources from the IT, from the security, from the compliance. And, and the whole idea is, again, basis of banking as a service is how we remove that friction. So we work super close with the Central Bank of the UAE. That was the first step, right? And at the same time, we're working super closely with Mashrik, whereby we've reached an agreement that we, together, we can collaborate and do that card, sponsorship, settlement, agreement, and arrangement and open it up for the fintech ecosystem in a safe manner, mm -hmm. right? And we've came up with a way that can really democratize that ecosystem. At the same time, we built our own tech stack to make sure it is designed to onboard the hundreds of fintechs at speed, right? Because Mashra can onboard the fintech, but their IT and technology was designed to serve the bank. It wasn't designed to be opened up for, for you know, hundreds of fintechs outside. So this is where the marriage comes in. So we put in our um, infrastructure that we've built that was designed specially to serve fintechs. Mashrik put in their you know, regulatory and, and, and all of their compliance assets. We grouped those. Uh, we worked super closely with the Central Bank of the UAE who issued us the first fintech license. It's called Retail Payment and Card Schemes. And now we have something super powerful and super unique in the market, whereby any fintech that can come to us, we can take them to market in four to six weeks. This is something that never existed back in the UAE. So this is like the best example when a bank partners up with a fintech, what is the outcome of that and how powerful that can be to an ecosystem. That sounds very exciting. I look forward to see what's happening with it. And speaking of which, before we finish today, gentlemen, I would like you to put on your future goggles and tell me what you expect the future to look like for customers. How are these trends that we're speaking about directly going to impact customers? I mean, you've already mentioned, for instance, the metaverse. Am I going to be putting on my VR headset to go towards my local branch to do my banking? What does the future of banking look like? How is fintech and how, are, how is this relationship and these marriages going to play into it together? Um, Fernando, perhaps you could kick us off on this one. I think it's an exciting future, but it's time to make really bold decisions. The future will be eminently digital, not just digital, will be mobile. Mobile will evolve. Mobile will be more and more embedded. Our whole lives will be in our mobile. We think that it is already happening. A lot more will happen. So mobile will be the repository of our lives. That will be connected with the digital world. We have to be there. Bold decisions like, and that's tough to say, but you have to, in order to get into a new world, you have to burn bridges and the vessels of the old one, and that's a bold decision. At Mashrek, we, we reduce our branch for by 80%. In order to be able to invest 
in what we believe is the best banking platform in this part of the world. In doing so, the future will provide our clients the best experiences. And that means personalization. We need to be able to get, as I said earlier, all the data around you with your consent and being able to anticipate and provide you with your solutions, either in our app or anywhere else. And that's what banking as a service is. Banking as a service is not just a future for the sake of it. It's a, it's a $7 trillion business okay, in the next five years. So it's a huge amount of money that will be poured down in that digital future. So we have to use the data to personalize. We have to use the data to design products and services that you will need, that today does not, don't, they don't exist and we'll do it in collaboration with, uh, with fintechs. And we need to make sure that whatever is happening there, and it's, it's going to be, and we, today we don't know, we will be able to connect. So we have to be an open-minded and an open architecture, open API architected company in order to be connected to that future. I think it's time for those bold decisions, and, and, and it's all about changing completely the way you operate. The, the, the profiles of the people that we used to have in banking are different from the profiles of the people that we are needing now and will need for the future. Again, if you came to, to Maastricht, you would see a lot of people wearing jeans, uh, running around places, working in a way that you would think it, it looks like Palo Alto uh, more than uh, the Middle East, right? So it's already bringing that fresh approach that will connect us with the, with the future. An example is and I finish with that. We've just launched yesterday, we've just launched Neonext. Neonext is our proposition to the, the teenagers, people, young people who are between 12 and 18. We have developed that app, which I believe is the best youth app in the world. We have co-created with them, just sitting down with them. These guys bring ideas by the second, by the second. Their ability to create and innovate is, is, is limitless, right? So being able to respond to that very quickly is the future. And you can only do that if your people, your incentives, your technology is already in the future or heading for the future. Very exciting. Bold, bold, very bold new announcements there as well. Omar, you have the last word. And your thoughts on the future of the future for customers? Yeah, I overlap with Fernando and I would wrap it with frictionless. Right. So how does the, all of this that Fernando was talking about translates to the end consumer? It's frictionless experiences, right? It's digital, it's mobile, it's built on data, it's built on open APIs. But how does the consumer see all of that? And he's going to see frictionless experiences. So all of your services that you are used to taking from a bank, they will just be better, faster, and frictionless. That's, that's how I see the future coming. A frictionless future. And on that note, Fernando, Omar, thank you both very much for joining me this thank morning. You. Appreciate you taking the time and speaking to us. And thank you. Please come back soon. Thank you. Thank you for having us.